optimism seems to be an important part of the enlightenment that you described yep. in the 18th century. Um, that optimism, I sometimes think of Jefferson as being more optimistic than Hamilton and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That is a, a, a patently optimistic view of human nature that leads people to have faith that democracy might work out. Is, is that optimism, uh, is that something that the 20th century imposed on the 18th century? Or do you see that kind of a uh, real serious optimism in human nature and, and the ability for a republic to function? Is that there? Yeah, oh, the optimism. We didn't, we didn't impose that afterwards. We didn't impose it afterwards. It's already there. And, and that's one of the things that makes that 18th century era so interesting to study. Because before that time, you know, the general sense of human history was that it was a decline from some wonderful era in the past, whether you chose the, you know, the Garden of Eden or you chose Greece and Rome. The idea was that the modern period had was declining from that wonderfulness. Um, but these were the first people to say, no, 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 we can actually be better. Uh, better than Greece and Rome, maybe better than the Garden of Eden. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, that's there in the 18th century. The word happiness is a powerful word. Jefferson, of course, we have an unalienable right to pursue it. And in your forthcoming book, mm -hmm. you talk in terms of happiness. How would you define happiness? I, I'm so happy that you asked that question that I'm worried people are going to think you were planted in the audience. Uh, so yeah, happiness happiness is one of those key words in the 18th century. But what I lay out in the introduction to my book is that happiness, in fact, means different things in the 18th century than it does today. So that um, line from the Declaration of Independence is one of the most quoted uh, passages in all of American history. We're always talking about pursuing happiness. Uh, one of its meanings is the meaning that we attach to happiness today, which is essentially private self-fulfillment. You know, I'm, I am happy when I have new shoes. I am happy when I've eaten a cookie. So that's, there, there's that kind of happiness. But the major meaning of happiness in the 18th century, one that we have lost today, is of what they call public or social happiness. And you can, you can find that phrasing a lot, social happiness, public happiness. And what they essentially meant by that was national security. It was the strength of the state to keep away foreign enemies and internal threats. And once a society enjoyed that kind of public happiness, of security, from attack and corruption, then they were freed to pursue their private happiness, to, to buy shoes and cookies and all of those things. And then they would have also added a third kind of happiness, which was the happiness, the eternal happiness of heaven. Now these are the first people who begin to think of um, earthly happiness as being the most important kind and to kind of put on the back burner the eternal happiness of heaven. Um, but I think that what Jefferson meant in the Declaration of Independence as the pursuit of happiness was very much that social happiness, that sense of public, collective, national security uh, as the primary meaning of that document, which is very, and I'm looking at Paul now, this is a very international document. It's directed outward. Um, so of course it would be speaking about national issues. So when we interpret it narrowly that you know, Jefferson says, says, I have the right to buy shoes. You know, this is an incorrect, uh, a narrow interpretation of what was a much more public and political and social meaning of happiness. What about the idea of American exceptionalism? Mm -hmm. How does that fit in? American exceptionalism. This feeds directly into today's talk. So the American Enlightenment is born in the 20th century in order to create an exceptional 18th century American Enlightenment. What I found in my book was in fact that there was much more shared about ideals of enlightenment among Europeans and Americans in the 18th century than anything very different. Now there were some particular pressure points in America that did not engage Europeans as much, and I talk about those in the book, and they have to do with the particular location of 
uh, the Americas. So, for example, slavery is a massive preoccupation of enlightened Americans, uh, American thinkers. Um, and so are questions about the American Indians. Uh, I have a whole chapter, I know it sounds really boring, but it's in fact really interesting, on the Republican problem of how to count the Indians um, using statistics, which are an enlightenment preoccupation. So, you know, suddenly uh, with the US Constitution, you have to decide whether to count the Indians or not and how do you count them? Um, so this becomes a very important preoccupation for Americans. So, but, but it's not American exceptionalism in the 20th century sense of that term as America having a God-given mission that is separate uh, from Europe. That's all invented in the 20th century. That's not there when you look at the 18th century conception of enlightenment. I guess this is sort of a follow-up to that. Mm -hmm. I, I think Obviously, your argument is very compelling about the creation of myths in the 20th century, but is it really so much out of whole cloth in the sense, do not similar periods occur at moments of national crisis to go back and create myths? So, I mean, just mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, Lincoln's whole idea of the union and his speeches about that, you know, in a different way, perform a similar role the arguments for manifest destiny. Yep. So is it, rather than being out of whole cloth, more another installment of a mm -hmm. pattern of myth creation? Yeah, the, we're always creating myths, and and I'm not going to tell people not to create myths because they do, and you know I don't tell Abraham Lincoln what to do, right? So, but but what I think is important is that we need to know when we're creating myths and why we're creating myths, and we also need to understand the effects that that myth-making has. So for the American Enlightenment, we were chatting a little bit about this before the talk, it has had the effect of essentially killing a field. It is so embalmed in reverence for, you know, it's like a, a, a museum. You're not allowed to, to touch anything, no fingerprints allowed. And that has made the books about the American Enlightenment, now don't quote me here, really boring. Um, the, the, all of those books I showed you uh, that came out in the bicentennial, there's a kind of reverential quality to them that we must celebrate, we do, we do this and that. Whereas the Europeans, they play with their enlightenment and, and they might get it wrong, you know, or they might say things that we don't agree with, like Jonathan Israel saying that Spinoza is at the center of everything of the European enlightenment. I don't agree with that, but at least it's interesting and it's engaging with the past. So what I'm trying trying to do in the book that, that is coming out this fall is, is to say, you know, once we strip away that reverential, that need for reverentialness, we can go back and play with our enlightenment and we can discover new things and we can see that they have a lot of the same preoccupations and mental habits that we do. They have doubt, they have uncertainty, they have anxiety. Um, and it doesn't mean that we say, well, the Constitution was a terrible idea because Madison thought that words had shifting meaning, so therefore nobody can read the Constitution or understand it in any way. Um, th that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, that the, the national tradition that we have is not of certainty. It's of uncertainty, and that's beautiful and wonderful, and we just need to get that out there because everybody's uncertain, and we have doubts about everything, so why not say that's, that's what we get from the 18th century, and it's freeing. Um, and it opens a room for, for intellectuals and for professors and for dialogue and, and all these kinds of things. So that's why I think it's important to understand myths. That mid-20th century myth-making moment where American exceptionalism plays into this, that's also the time when uh, Tocqueville's Democracy in America is republished again and again and again in the 40s and 50s. So there does seem to be a direct sort of connection there, right? Could you maybe say a little about uh, if there are other texts in addition to Tocqueville's that uh, are playing into this moment of uh, uh, you know, exceptionalizing the American past? Yeah, uh, yeah, that is the moment. It's also a moment of rediscovering Jefferson. Um, and I, I think that moment has ended now because uh, I saw Hamilton the musical in New York, so he's the man now. Um, and if you've seen that, um, 
that musical or listen to it, one of the extraordinary things that's happening there is the denigration of Thomas Jefferson, uh, who is portrayed as having missed the entire American Revolution, which of course is not true, right? Um, he didn't miss any of it. So uh, yeah, so there's um, one of the, so in addition, Tocqueville comes out, Democracy in America. Of all the texts that have democracy in their title in the early 19th century, which is a huge and growing number, uh, there's also the invention uh, by Isaiah Berlin, the philosopher, of this notion of a counter-enlightenment. He coins that term in 1973, uh, the counter-enlightenment. And that also has had this really dreadful effect on Enlightenment studies because it suggests that there was this unified block of opposition to people in the Enlightenment and it makes people write crazy books about this thing called the counter-Enlightenment, like counter-insurgency, uh, but there was never anything like that. In the people who call themselves enlightened, they weren't really joiners, you know, they were the kind of people who didn't join groups because they were free thinkers, so there wouldn't have been a counter-insurgency of, of any kind. And, and the, and you can't find the term counter-enlightenment in the 18th century. You can actually find almost no antonyms created out of the word enlightenment. Um, unenlightened is the best that they can do, and they hardly ever use uh, that term. I guess the, the opposite in the 18th century would be barbaric uh, as the opposite of, of enlightenment, and, and that has different connotations in the 20th century. So I think Isaiah Berlin uh, is another example of somebody um, with this term counter-enlightenment who's who's creating a, a mythical thing that we now have to contend with.